An estimated 23 million American adults have chronic kidney disease. More than 100,000 of them are waiting for a kidney. St. Louis entrepreneur Charlotte Otley is one of them. We'll hear her story when we come back. Welcome back to City Corner. I'm Tim Lampley here with Charlotte Otley, entrepreneur and senior consultant to the president and CEO of the Urban League of Metropolitan St. Louis, Mr. Michael McMillan. Just to give you an idea of her life's accomplishments and journey, take a look at this. Listen as your day unfolds, challenge what the future holds. Charlotte Otley has been called the dream merchant. Her storied life says it all. During a career that spans over 30 years, her ability to think big opened doors for her to become a university instructor of physical medicine, broadcast producer, and on-air talent in St. Louis and New York, an author and entrepreneur. The keys to everything is to, if you're going to do something, do it with pride. If you're going to do it, be enthusiastic about it, because if you aren't, no one else is going to be. Uh, to be sincere, because even a dog and a baby know when you aren't. And to be inclusive and show you care. It's fascinating the number of dignitaries and celebrities Charlotte has worked with. Meeting Miss Dunham, Catherine Dunham, as a college senior and remaining friends with her until her death. Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee. Anna Maria Horsford, Ray Goodman and Brown, Malik Yoba, and even Presidents Clinton and Nelson Mandela. Uh, that's when I was uh, representing the American Urban Radio Network. And so when Mandela became president, they called American Urban Radio Network and said, Mandela's going to be here, we're going to make a major announcement, we would like black media, you know, up front. So they called me, put me on a plane, I came and I organized the entire press conference and made sure on the mics were our IDs. Hundreds of pictures reveal her astounding journey that began as a child growing up in East St. Louis. Her family, Pillars of the Community, was her foundation and motivation. So this is the threesome, Edward, Charlotte, and Dolores. I was raised with my family owning all of the taxi companies. We had 150 checker cabs. We had three service stations, um, and later my dad expanded to three more. And we had uh, entertainment facilities. People know the Regal Room. They know Cosmo Hall. And if you go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you'll see Chuck Berry at Cosmo Hall. Charlotte graduated with her master's degree in communications from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale and earned a certificate in business management from Northwestern University's Kellogg Center. Her foray into the world of television came after talking to media representatives about a sleep exhibit in downtown St. Louis. Well, at that time, I'm physical medicine. I understand how the brain is working, so I could explain that exhibit to the media. So I started doing interviews, and one of the people from um, the media just said, you should be a media. Charlotte took that advice and was offered a job at KMOV Channel 4. She remained with the station 11 years, and in that time, to her surprise, she won her first local Emmy Award over talk show host Sally Jesse Raphael. Because she was a national show, I was a local show, and that was a win for St. Louis. She also recalls when CBS gave a whopping $1.2 million to the St. Louis market. I divided it between 13 organizations that renovated the dance school for Katherine Denham. It created the boys' home for Annie Malone. It bought the bleachers for Matthew Dickey's Boys Club, and the list goes on. In 1990, Charlotte left St. Louis for the Big Apple to work for WNBC. There, she won three more Emmy Awards. Other awards would follow, including two PRSA Golden Apple Awards, the President's Award from the NAACP in East St. Louis, and one from Crane, New York's 100 Most Powerful Minority Business Leaders. 
In addition, she has been featured in Essence and Time magazines and selected as the first African-American alumni of the year at SIU Carbondale. In 2005, Charlotte returned to St. Louis where she works with the Urban League of Metropolitan St. Louis and its director, Michael McMillan, on major projects throughout the year. She authored several handbooks on personal and professional success. Her recent book is entitled Surviving Success, Changes, Challenges, and Choices. In addition to all of that, she is now a contributing columnist for the Ledoux News. But despite all of her career accomplishments, she says her true legacy is the Women's Center named in her honor. The Charlotte Merritt's Otley Transitional Women's Center helps women transition into fulfilling lives that are substance-free. So someone to think enough of me and how I've lived my life, that they would choose me, my image, to stand for women who are challenged, women who have gone through what they've had and still find me worthy. What's next for you? You know, I'm so excited. I think it's going to be something special. <laughs> I'm not sure. Because for some reason, I never get what I think I'm going after. It doesn't matter whether it's a man whether it's a job, I never get what I go after. But what I get is always much better. It's like, whoa. Lady, and I'm very it's always so much better. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love it? Charlotte <laughs> Otley, thank you for joining us today. Oh, my. It's great to oh see my. you, as always. Uh, You've had a lot of experiences in life, and when did we do that? In 2000? 2016. 2016. Like and this is a new experience for you, and, and enlightening, wouldn't you say? You know, uh, Tim, I've kissed death in the face five times. Those were acute situations. Went into surgery right away, and did what you need to do to heal. But never have I experienced what I'm experiencing now in learning that I have kidney failure and all of the good and the bad that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. And it's been a game changer in my life. When did you decide to go public? It took me a while, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, we're ways to never let you see them, never let them see you sweat. Mm -hmm. We've been raised to, no matter what's going on in the house, when you walk outside, hold your head up high, no one uh, wants to get on a losing bandwagon. So all of those pride things were going through my mind. Mm -hmm. So I found out in February and... Uh, of 2018? This of year? 2018, okay. two years after I said, I don't know what's coming, but it's gonna be great, right? Um, and it took me a long time, and it took a friend sitting at my dining room table and confronting me that I had to tell my friends. You have to tell people. You have people out there who would care. I said, you know, I don't have that experience. Um, I've been private. I'm pretty much a loner. And uh, I'm more comfortable giving than receiving. And I definitely don't know how to ask. Oh, did she take me on? I mean, we were hollering at each other. And I mean, it was vigorous. Because I feared the rejection. And I feared, you've done all of this, and you couldn't take care of yourself. I was embarrassed. And, um, but when I did, the world opened up. I mean, the love and people who found out the calls that were being made. Even students that I had back in the 70s were calling. And even to today, people are expressing their support and their love in every way that they can. So no, this isn't, I didn't pray for all of this outpouring of love. I just prayed that God would use me to make me pleasing to him in his sight, and that I would be, have a life on purpose. Well, I didn't plan to get on the cross. I mean, <laughs> I didn't want to be the one who had to suffer. But I'm telling you, if you had to go through this journey, 
the fact that somebody loves you and is willing to walk that journey with you is priceless. And as strange as it sounds, that's been the glory mm. in you, all you, the tragedy. And you realize this is typical that people have these reservations about coming out, being public about any... Any problem. Yeah, cancer, problem. Uh, you know, whatever it is, yes. that battle because they don't want people to feel sorry for them. They Judgment. don't want rejection, it, all, of those, all of those things. So in your coming out and letting people know mm -hmm. that this is a battle that you're facing because this is a fight for your life, right. you're helping a lot of other people. And you well, do understand that. Yeah, but you know, you got, it took me from February to like sometime in August to get through the feeling that I had let people down. I mean, I have a surrogate nephew to this day I feel I failed him because he's so into health and he tried to do things like getting me to drink certain teas and do that so many people look up to me or care for me, I felt I let them down. Let's rewind just quickly just mm -hmm. to say, where are you now? I'm in uh, very closer than I'd like to be uh, to total renal failure. I have opted to so not, having kidney disease, which is, uh, which is what no, I talked about I have, with 23 right, million, no, and having kidney, kidney failure, failure, those are two uh, different things. Exactly, which means I need a kidney donor. Um, dialysis is a dash in between. And I have chosen to try to maintain as long as I can to go straight to uh, a kidney transfer. So that's my appeal. Today. So you're not on dialysis right now? I'm not now. on dialysis by the grace of God and me doing what exactly I'm supposed to do. And so many times I've said, shoulda, woulda, coulda, mm -hmm. but I can't dwell in How that place right now. How do your doctors right feel now. about that? Well, my doctors are very proud of me. They uh, have warned me, however, that I'm very close to needing dialysis and they're watching me very closely. Mm -hmm. And the ideal, of course, if you can go straight to a kidney donor. And so I'm, I'm keeping my numbers as good as I can. They're watching me. I'm doing everything now that I should have been doing. All right, so when we come back, we're gonna talk about some of the things you've learned along the way Definitely. here and how people can reach out to you or to the agency in order to see if they are Please. actual, um, one of your candidates to be donors. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be right back after Thank this. Thank you. Have you seen that piece on the Tiffany Neighborhood on STL TV? No. Let me show you. My wife and I were looking for homes, we lived in the city all of her life, and there's just a, a different energy when you're in, in the city. Keep up with what's happening in your neighborhood. Watch STL TV. Be in the know. Do you want to know what city government is doing for you? Yes, Mr. President, uh, Board Bill 69 Committee substitutes the budget bill for the Parking Commission. And this bill is a big deal and a great deal for the citizens of the city of St. Louis. Watch STL TV, the city government channel, then you'll know. What can I say about Charlotte Oddly? She is someone who has helped so many people for so long in St. Louis and New York and across this entire country that I am personally excited to be a part of the Kidney for Charlotte movement because we need to keep her in this community, make her whole and make her healthy so that she will then be able to continue to help thousands of people throughout the St. Louis region and across this country. So I am personally committed, excited to be involved and it very, very, very much so interested in making sure that every person who has the capacity to get tested and find out if they are capable of being a donor does so, so that we can improve her quality of life immediately. Charlotte Otley is one of thousands with kidney failure and is here to talk about her journey to find a donor. 
It's interesting that Mr. McMillan said that you were the person to, to call on when someone needs help, and now you're in the position where you have to reach out to other people. Was that hard? Extremely hard. It's extremely hard to ask for anybody, mm -hmm. uh, but it was particularly hard for me because I'm supposed to be the one who can give. I'm supposed to be the one who can fix it. I'm supposed to be the answer, not the problem. And so I had to deal with that. And the reality of dealing with that was a, sh a deterioration that was happening in me that I tried to hide. Mm -hmm. Waking up in the morning nauseated to the point that I couldn't get out of bed because the toxins from my kidney were making me ill. Or the scars on my legs from the eczema that would happen because I was drying out from the diabetic diabetic or my legs that were going out because the uric acid this is was your spilling. reality this, this is, is my reality. reality and it made me stop taking engagements because people don't know what you're going through when they see you they they say oh you're really looking bad Are you okay wrong thing to say i mean <laughs> yeah. or They've heard that you were sick, and they even, said... Even if you weren't I know, dealing I know. with that, isn't But they didn't mean any it? harm. Yeah. They, you know, they're concerned. They know you work. Are you the same? You don't look sick. I heard you were sick. It's a compliment in there somewhere. But all of those things shift your life, where it's an ability to say, uh, I can't commit to tomorrow because I don't know how I'm going to feel. And uh, even down to when the gout happens, from the uric acid, not being able to drive. So it's a lot of different mm -hmm. things, but I want the listeners, the viewers to know not to be afraid to open up and trust somebody and trust they're gonna love you and understand back. Mm -hmm. And those people who are trying to help you, don't be so heavy handed with loving. I know you're camouflaging sometimes your own frustration. Uh, someone once said to me, you don't have a Charlotte. Now, uh, that's a double message. In other words, I'm not the if one. If you're the go-to person, I'm then, not the, so then, you don't have a Charlotte. You don't have a person So like it's some yourself, realities so. that you have to deal with. And um, even with relationships with men, you know, because sometimes there's a toxin and you say, oh, I hope they can't smell anything or, you know, so it's a lot of That's reality, though, That's when, a reality. When you're battling you've got to find someone you can trust. Disease, you've yes. got to talk to somebody because you'll go crazy sitting by yourself recycling that information and, and you'll drift into why me and that. So I've, and this one thing, this was my shock. This was my shock deciding on who your power of attorney to because you've got to prepare yourself for okay, the inevitable. So, so I'm, I'm a little confused mm -hmm. by, by this. Is this something that when they talk about power of attorney, you're talking about somebody making decisions if about your life to me, if you're exactly. not able to do that. So is that something that, they, that your doctors approach you with? Yes. Well, before you, what? Well, any right after, doctor is before you go into surgery. Okay. Any doctor is going to approach you with that. But when you may have a day or a year or two years before that moment comes, you still have to deal with the inevitable. That you may not It make still it. had to be a shock, though, that oh, someone no. approached it's, you. It's, it's more than a shock. It's, I have no children. I have no brothers and sisters that are my blood. Mm -hmm. I have two people, a sister in Chicago and, and a brother in New York that I would swear and you would swear that they belong to me and I belong to them. But the reality is, who would I leave what to? Who cares? Uh, you go through all of those changes. And then when you have to do your will, and you, it's, it, it's just a reality and it's nobody to talk to. It's nobody sitting across from the table who has a stake in it that can listen to you. So that's a part, there's a medical piece, but there's an emotional piece and a preparatory piece that you're preparing just in case that you may not make it through. And uh, that is a tough place to be. And then not with me, as active as I am, it's a concern that you're letting people down all the time. You know, the person that you saw on camera, um, 
is my chief client, my friend, my power of attorney. I work for him. Uh, he's my bread and butter when it comes to what I'm dealing with. But I hate telling him, I can't make it to this meeting this morning. I, I'm just too sick. You know, or I've left a blood test and it's just left me weak. So those are things that there needs to be an understanding and a tolerance when a recipient seeking a donorship and going through this is needing donors. And, 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 the, and, and it's just you need somebody to make this easy for you. You need a friend to tough love, yeah. but understand. Well, it's great that you have the support of Mike because uh, oh, I've been knowing Mike for many years and... He's definitely one of those people who will be supportive to the end. Oh, compassion no to what. the end. Um, you talked about uh, the symptoms. Yes. And it's interesting that you thought that perhaps if you lost a little weight or if you ate better, uh, then these symptoms would go away, not understanding that this was a matter of... I was of only worried control. about getting to a stage you had to have insulin because diabetes, high blood pressure are two of the main factors. Come to find out, I had anemia. I had been given medicine that was really for a person at insulin level, not at 7.1 or 2 on the uh, that scale, glucose scale, and a lot of things. And I didn't deal with the stress. Stress is a byproduct of our business. I mean, how many times do you and I work almost 48 hours oh. on a piece? Oh. So someone telling me de-stress, me. I mean, it's like... <laughs> Duh, you know, <laughs> this is what I do. I take stress off of yeah, other people. You do. So, no, it, it's a whole new world. Was there a history of it in your family? No. And did they ask you that? I know no. that's one of the things people wonder. You know what? I didn't know this was uric acid stopped me from walking. I've been wearing boots and in pain mm -hmm. and going into urgent care. And I was in the emergency room on a gurney. And a doctor was checking me and said, oh, this is gout. I said, gout? Because gout was something that um, people that smoked cigars and had steak every night and drank Jack Daniels mm. had. Not, not me. So, you know, it was everything has been a wake-up call for me. And I hope this is not in vain. So tell people how, I guess, what to do if they if they are possibly, uh, you know, uh -huh. if they would like to become a donor, or how they can see if they, they are well, eligible to be donors. Well, the big thing is um, don't spend too much time worrying about it and questioning. Call the number that you'll probably see on your screen. And that number is 1-800-633-9906 with an extension of four. Exactly. Now, when you call that number, it's on the screen for you. say to them, I am calling because I want to be screened for Charlotte Otley. But I also make the appeal that I just need one kidney. There are thousands of people who need your support. So if you don't match me, you may want to say, well, I'm available for anybody else to save their lives as well. And uh, be persistent. If they don't call you, call them back. Uh, because there is a process you have to ask, then they ask you questions, send you a folder, then you start going through screening. But you have up until the moment before the anesthesia to turn back. But take the step mm -hmm. for life's sake. Take What's your steps. timeline for finding a donor? Oh, who knows? Um, God knows, you know. But right now, I met with my doctor yesterday. I'm right on the margin of I've got to go into dialysis if I go down one more point. And uh, at five, you're a critical state and they have to make a decision if I don't have a kidney. I'm already over four. So I'm at a critical point. So I've been telling everybody all I want for Christmas is a kidney. And I promise you, um, it's, I, I just, I see people, more sick mm -hmm. than I am. I see people whose life hasn't been as blessed as mine have. And I've lived the best life that I know I can live. And I feel that I am I need your support too. We saw your story and that yes. was leading to my question about who you engaged 
in, in your search for a donor, because I know you've done a, a number every, of things. Everybody, I've, I've made little, what I call life cards to, to pass them out, pass them out. Uh, shows like this, uh, radio, TV. Um, I write letters and I open my mouth and ask, and which is hard for me, but you would be surprised at the response. It's almost shameless. Uh, people say, how are you today? Fine, I need a kidney. Mm. How's the weather today? Great, I need a <laughs> kidney. I mean, uh, I've gone to the other extent to ask for help to continue my life and a quality of life. And you're bringing awareness. Was yes. that, was, is now, and when I look at that, I'm, I'm almost thinking that somehow you were prepared, like, like your, your faith prepared you to be able to, to forget the embarrassment, to go out here and do it, not just for yourself, but to bring awareness to it and for other people. You know, well. Tim, that was hard for me. See, it's always easy to fix somebody else and fight for somebody else. And that's who I am. I'm the defender. I'm the lion. I, I go get and them. And even the dream maker, like I said but, in the video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was hard for me. But the more I'm doing this and the more I'm talking about it and the more I'm being exposed to the number of people who are suffering, we have to open up as a people and understand the problem, how big the problem is, and if it's any way we can help. Mm -hmm. If it's any way we can take that step into being a donor, at least spreading the word, we can save thousands of lives. Can we put that number on the screen again? Right. And again, um, tell people why it's important to get screened to see if exactly. they can be donors. It, yeah, because you don't know. You really don't know whether, it's not just blood type, it's some other circumstances. And I also wanted to give you a number that's not a medical number, but a recipient who's gone through this, who can give you referrals mm. as well. Great, and there's one thing before, you, before we leave too. I, I have a book I got from Jennifer Lewis when I interviewed her, and I understand that at some point um, we, you, we were discussing having a silent auction, mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to give that book to you oh. to use Thank you. Um, in that auction if that occurs okay. so that um, we can raise oh, awareness and get more um, people involved in yeah, this the search. The costs are pretty prohibitive. The cost is $1,500 a month just for medication. Well, trans, uh, plantation, plant, plantation, I get this. <laughs> it's, it's me trying well, to see the you know, prompter like from here. <laughs> 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 it's always available, although there is a limited um, organ availability. This is the information you need. It's on the screen. Again, the number is 1-800-633-9906. And please call extension four. Thank you, Charlotte Otley, for joining us. And, and thank prayer you. is my game changer. Pray prayer is Keep the, those prayers pray going. Prayer is it. And I'll be praying for you and so many thank other you. people out there will as thank well. You. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, everybody. We'll thank see you again you. next time.